Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat interview, and I'm here with Emily. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Hey, we're the same. We're we're like close time zones. Usually, I'm talking to people that are continents away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, Emily Mancini, an architect at Simpraxis Consulting, and I am based out of St. Petersburg, Florida. All right, and uh, how long have you been an MVP? Uh, about a week and a half. A week so, and a half. Re- yeah, exciting times. I'm on this stint of all like the brand new people. I see like the, like the, now people don't realize this too, that it used to be that uh, MVPs were, uh, were added on a quarterly basis is now they can be added, you know, every month. And so when you see those notifications hit LinkedIn, I usually go and I stock that the MVP buzz hashtag. Who's new? Who's like excited about it? And, and like a hey, great time to you introduce you to get to know you the get to know me interview so <laughs> well why don't you give us some of your background like how long have you been in space what's your mvp your your, your practice area uh office apps and services so i specialize in user experience and information architecture and i've been at some praxis consulting for just about two years before joining Simpraxis, I actually worked with Mark and Julie um, as I was a platform owner at a biotech. So they were one of the partners who helped us do our custom development. So I've known them for quite a few years. So it was uh, quite the dream job to then leave there and join them and be at Simpraxis well, with our amazing group of Mark, Julie, Todd, yeah. Derek, and Mike. They, they are great. I know everybody on the team, friends with them for a long time. So I, I miss seeing uh, uh, Mark is a great, uh, he has a great sense of humor, but uh, it, it's always great to do something that's just silly and ridiculous. And he automatically plays like the the straight face, like, I don't know what you're talking about, kind of. <laughs> it's great to play off of, but always enjoy being around that team. And Todd, of course, I uh, like to poke fun at him all the time. But uh, some smart people, great team over at Simpraxis, though. Those that aren't familiar, go take a look if you can figure out how to spell it. I think you guys probably should have variations of URLs that you own for people that don't know how to, to, to find it, but it's pretty much spelled the way that it sounds. Well, so- yeah, based based off a Greek word for collaboration. So for those who are fluent, you know, maybe not as hard to spell. It's, uh, we're simpatico. I mean, my I've got collab <laughs> talk, which is my community effort. So it's all about collaboration. Well, it's very cool. So what's the, some of the stuff that you talk about and present it? Because I know everybody at Simpraxis is very involved in community activities as well. So what kind of stuff are you out talking about? So it's been a pretty exciting week and a half. I also just joined the PNP team. So I'm part of the Sharing is Caring initiative. So a part of that kind of overlaps with all the other areas that I'm interested in, which are also the Microsoft community docs, which I know Mark has been working on for quite a while. So creating that documentation for the businesses and IT pros under Microsoft Community Docs, I'm also working on the maturity model for Microsoft 365. So something that Sadie Van Buren kicked off quite a few years ago. I've talked a lot about that. So yeah, very involved. In fact, I did a governance version of that and a social collaboration version of that years ago, all built off of Sadie's work. Yep. Oh, excellent. Well, uh, we probably have some upcoming initiatives that we'd love your feedback on and always feel free to go into that repo, read those articles and give us some uh, feedback I, on what I, you think I about often, the updates. I, you know, I point people to the, the work that was done, the stuff that's on a docs now. So I know that there's been some partners like Peter Carson up in Canada and other, you know, Eric Riz also up in Canada that have been doing some work around the maturity model and kind of mapping that to to tools and and uh, and, and working that into their consulting practices as a way, which I think is a really smart thing. And I, Microsoft has written some articles as well where they're encouraging that kind of thing for partners to go and do. So. Makes sense. Yeah, we see a lot of organizations not really knowing. They turn it on and they're like, great, we're all going to work together a lot better now. But they're really trying to, not, missing that framework of, well, what do I want to be doing and where should I be depending on these different aspects of your organization? Because, for example, six person company like Simpraxis, we don't necessarily need the same maturity that you need at a 30,000 biotech, right? right. 
Well, that's that's the thing. It's one of the most common questions that I I hear. I say this a lot, so I'm feel like I'm repeating myself, but uh, new to you, Emily. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, where, where people want very prescriptive guidance, they want to know specifically like which tools do I use at which part? How, how is the you know the the kind of the orchestration of the various tools? How do I make it work within it? And and they don't like the answer of well, it really kind of depends. It depends on the size of your organization, the collaboration culture of your organization. What are people accustomed to? Are you very process oriented, or is it more social or email based? Is it more project management based, um, task based? And and each of those you can have a completely different uh, assortment of solutions that you might uh, add into the mix. And so what's great about having something like the maturity model concept is to have an idea to go in and, and assess where you are. And it's great to get help from a partner to help do that assessment, but assess where you are. And then just, and, and you might be fine at that level. I'm, we're at a level, I know what, you know, CMM level, like level two, do I need to be a level five? No, I think, Three is really where we want to be in this category. And to do that per workload and think about overall, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a healthy operational activity to constantly assess and reassess uh, where you are and look at what else could we be doing. That's what digital transformation is all about. Knowing where you are today and where you want to be tomorrow and then figuring out a path to get there. That's digital transformation. Agreed. And, you know, not just based off the tech, based off of real business need right. to support what the business is doing. And I feel like that's where people get lost really often is, yeah, I get really excited about cool new tech as well. But if it's not relevant to helping my business, that's not necessarily where I should be spending my time. Right. Well, that's always the I, look, I, I started my career a long time ago as a technical project manager. And I worked on projects where I was given like a directive, like you will go and deploy in this technology. And we deployed some beautiful things. It is highly functional. And then, then nobody used. Guess what it was looked at as viewed at? A failure. Yeah. So I did it right. I did what I was asked to do. But then my name was attached to something that nobody used. And then therefore, and, and adoption and engagement were never, didn't really factor in. I did the trainings. Like people were onboarded. I yeah. checked it off the list, but then people weren't using it. And that's why understanding why it's so important, to, like the culture of your organization and what do we really need to be doing? Because um, at the end of the day, you know, like collaboration technology, we used to say this about SharePoint all the time. Um, and I was always one of these people that's like, sometimes it's okay to be a laggard and to stay on the older version that you've customized and do that if it's meeting those business needs. There's that opportunity cost, there's new features, there's new capabilities, better integrations, all those kinds of things. And if the value of those things is greater than the cost of getting there, the time, the expense, all that kind of stuff, then it, it might be, hey, you're fine to stay where you are for now. A right. Yeah. And Microsoft hopefully, they, yeah, they sell, hopefully sellers hate that. I should say. Yeah, that, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, hopefully those conversations are also coming outside of not just IT, right? So this idea that this whole collaboration platform is owned by that one department, I, I disagree with, right? So making sure that all of those decisions of where you're spending your time on your projects is coming from some kind of cross-functional steering committee. So you're meeting all of the needs of the business and helping everyone across the organization. You don't just have one half the organization totally on Microsoft 365 and the other one on on the file share. And, and I realize that in some organizations, it might be very one-sided and you might have, it might be driven by the CTO or CIO or the IT department around those things. But, um, and that's where, you know, really having good uh, leadership team sponsorship for that to make sure that it is, hey, this is a, an entire company solution. Things like, you know, rolling out Microsoft Teams might be IT that supports the desktops and supports all the applications. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it, it can't be a tech driven deployment. It needs to fit in and there needs to be ongoing, you know, uh, community management, you know, success management type uh, uh, view of the world and, and, uh, and then discussion about how do we uh, make this a, a better uh, solution for all of the business needs. And, and that ongoing, it's, it's a change management discussion. And Absolutely. Of, most organizations are really bad at change management. <laughs>
Yeah, that's fair. When uh, I was a platform owner at the biotech, when I joined the company, there was 150 people. And then by the time I had left, within a span of four years, we grew to 1500. So we had that really big challenge where we had all of our, you know, sales general admin really into Microsoft 365. But then we had this whole other wing of scientists who had legitimate use for using this public drive all the time because their instruments output their data there. And this was a whole unmet need of how they were collaborating. And so one of the things I did there was make that steering committee get some of the scientific leadership into the room so they had a better understanding of the platform and could see align their goals to how I could support them with the technology, because a lot of their goals are common and easy to solve with Microsoft 365. It's, you know, transparency and decision making, making sure that people can collaborate across cross functional groups. These are all things that we can absolutely solve with teams and all of these other solutions. See, be, be honest with me. Was it difficult to get them to sit down to get to that point, though, where those meetings were productive? Did people push back and fight initially? On, on having that kind of holistic discussion of, you know, of, of, you know coming together, everybody? Because that was, that's been my experience. Is, yeah. Is once people uh, start, like feel they get like trust built within the change management process, they're okay. But that usually takes time to convince, convince people. It does. I didn't start um, the initiation of that conversation until a couple years in. So we had a pretty uh, solid background and track record of having successful implementations. And when we first launched Microsoft 365, I focused a lot on productivity training. So we essentially revolutionized the way people took and shared notes. We started out with OneNote, right? And trying to raise that transparency just from something immediately actionable that doesn't require a lot of IT support. So it's probably about a year to two years. And when I first joined the company, I actually had joined from the HR department and in a support role. So I already had established relationships with the C-suite. So they already all knew me. So when I came to them with my pitch and proposal, which was very formal, the what's in it for them, I already had some mapping of their goals to how the platform could do it. And I didn't have anybody push back at all. They were all absolutely there for it. So I think partly showcasing why it mattered, they yep. saw the impact we could make and then coming to them with a clear deliverable of, hey, this is one hour of your time every month. I'm not giving you pre-reads and I'm not giving you action items. I just need you in the room to make sure we prioritize the correct projects. They were all in. Yeah. Well, that's a, that I, I think from what you just described, maybe that was one mistake that I had was uh, I required pre-reads. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> effort. So I, I get that. So I do it again. It would be like, you just show up. No, there's nothing you need to do. I just need you there. I need your attention in the room. You give me that 30, 45 minutes and everything that you need to know will be encapsulated within that. That would have been a winning strategy. Yeah. Yeah. As a former uh, executive assistant for many years, I worked full time to pay my way through college. Uh, I knew that nobody did the pre-reads at any company I've ever worked at. So I was like, realistically, it's not going to happen for me either. So I'm not going to try. Yeah. How can I better distill my message, which also helps you practice for external speaking in the community of what are the absolute minimum top points that I need to fit into this 45 to 60 minutes? Yeah. Well, that's where that whole uh, that, that whole meme came from, like, uh, you know, could this meeting have been an email? Could this, yeah. <laughs> like, that comes from that. If people not planning that out, why do we actually need to, to meet? I have no problem when people respond to me too and say we had time set up to go through stuff. It's like, can we just do this over email? Yes, we can. I have no problem with that. You know, we don't need to go through the rest of it and talk about weather for five minutes and then go, th go through that structure. So. No, that, that is great. Well, it's really cool. So what else is, uh, what's coming up in this Simpraxis world? What are you guys working on? What are you doing? Anything that you want to share with the community? Sure. So we started this year, you know, in, in light of the pandemic and us all being home and a lot of the speaking gigs shifting, we started doing these bi-weekly webinars called Ask Simpraxis. So it's every other Wednesday for a half an hour. And we always have a topic, but the goal is also to have it be kind of like an open office hours where we have our pre-canned presentation, should no one have a lot of questions, but we're also here to talk through hearing what our clients and anyone in the community is 
thinking about and trying to work through. So we just did one this week. Um, it, we called it the Todd Show because it was about PowerShell and what's new in PowerShell. Oh, it just wasn't about Todd. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was not. And then let's see, I'm looking at my calendar. The 24th, we're doing another one and it's all going to be about uh, reactions to Viva and talking about uh, what's going on there. Yeah, I'll be interested to, uh, to check that out and your responses to that. I think there's a longer discussion. We won't get into it, but given your... Uh, your background with, uh, you know, the the classification of data, and metadata, and all that kind of like that side of things, and from the SharePoint world, and get your thoughts. I certainly have mine uh, uh, about uh, uh, Aviva and what it will take for people to actually uh, start using the the new capabilities. Uh, it, it's going to be an interesting discussion, ongoing discussion. Yeah, we're actually it's the it's the topic. I can't remember if I included you in the invites that I just sent out for this month's tweet jam is- Oh, nice, you know, I would love to. And it's, uh, you know, I love that kind of stuff. Just, I'm sure just like you guys are doing, you, you're you gonna present on stuff, but I'm more interested in the, to hear the questions. What kind of questions do people have? And just kind of broad community pulse to the, of the community. What are people thinking about this? Um, Cause often with that, when you open things up like that, you're like, I never thought of it that way. It's like, you get so, uh, you know, uh, uh, like single-minded about, and here's the target customer, here's the use cases, this is how, here's what the features go and do. And then somebody comes in and says, well, this is how we actually work and be like, it's a scenario we never thought of, so. Absolutely. I mean, to your point, that's my, one of my favorite parts about being involved in the community is all of these different perspectives and challenging each other's thoughts and being able to expand all of our thinking together. I think we can accomplish a lot of different things. And also, I feel really grateful to the community early on when I was changing my career towards where I am now. I had met Sue Hanley and Mark Anderson early on, and they just absolutely uh, changed my interests in where I wanted to head and were always mentors to me as I went through this process. So I'm deeply thankful to them. Yeah, they're, they're some of my favorite people out there. There's, uh, there's a lot of very smart people, a lot of fun people within the community. It's the, it truly is the, uh, and, and, and I'm specifically talking about the, the SharePoint community that like built up. So these folks like Mark that I've known for over a decade, you know, all kind of met them at that SharePoint conference 2009. And, and there's just a huge group of people that are still like that I talk to on a weekly basis. Although yeah. Mark is more stranger to me now, so it's a uh, one of those the the, the downside to the, the to the pandemic is people that I would do these uh, you know these big catch up moments, see at events and stuff that aren't happening. But I'll have to track him down and waste a bunch of his time. He <laughs> to your point, that's my favorite part about being part of the sharing is caring team too, is, you know, Hugo Bernier and David Warner and um, April Dunham, like spending time with them. It's also hanging out with friends while you're doing stuff for the community. So how nice that we can all connect across the globe from our desks and still have that relationship building time too. Exactly. Well, Emily, people want to find out more about you or get in touch with you. What are the best ways they, they can reach you? Uh, Twitter's always great. So at EE Mancini, please feel free to reach out, ask me any questions. I'm always happy to talk through use cases and hear your feedback, hear what you're struggling with, hear cool success stories too. I feel like people don't often share those. And I definitely want to hear more about something cool that you've done that you want to tell the world about. Yeah. And do you have like a short snappy URL for the office hours or is it long winded drawn out, you've got to go search for it to find those. I'm sure that it's simp.info slash ask simpraxis. And if it's not, I'll be doing it immediately after this meeting. <laughs> okay. All right, we're gonna, we'll check that. So, well, Emily, really appreciate the time and getting to talk to you and congratulations again on your uh, new MVP, well-deserved. Thank you and thanks so much for having me. Yep. We'll talk to you soon. Wow.